Okay, so what I want to do is um, begin with an example that will be familiar to us now. Um, let's say I pick a couple of vectors in R4. So um, we can pick whichever ones we want. So let's say it's like 2, 1, 0, negative 3. There's one vector in R4. Let me pick another vector. So, so these are vectors in R4. So, so here's another one. How about like, uh, I guess since it's R4, it doesn't have to be integers, but let's keep our life simple. 0, 1, 1, I don't know, 0. And, and should we pick like one more? Um, what if we pick something like, I don't know, 3, 0, 0, 1. OK. I, I didn't think too much about these. I just kind of put some numbers. I made one of them negative to make it look all special and nice. But, but now we can ask questions about these vectors. And so one question we're well equipped to answer is, are these linearly independent? Are these linearly independent in R4? Okay. How do we answer this? We want to ask, are there some coefficients c1 times the first vector plus some c2 times the second vector plus some c3 times the third vector? Do there exist non-trivial coefficients that make this come out to be the zero vector? Zero, 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 zero is all the way down, right? The zero vector. Yeah? That's why we're looking for solutions to this. Of course, there's the trivial solution, all zero, but we're asking is there any non-trivial solution. If there is a non-trivial solution, like two times the first guy, minus three times, or whatever, you could solve for one in terms of the others, which would tell you it's not linearly independent. It's linearly dependent. One depends on the others. If there is no solution, it's linearly independent. OK, so here we go. We're looking for a solution here like, this is tough. How do we do this? Well, we just think about the first values. This is saying 2 times c1 plus 0 c2s plus 3 c3s is 0. Then we go to the next line. A c1 plus a c2 should be 0 as well. The, the third row now, 0 c1s plus 1 c2 plus 0 c3s should be 0, and negative 3 c1s plus 0 c2s plus 1 c3 should also be 0. Now, you might look at this and be like, OK, here we have four equations, three unknowns. You might worry this is an overdetermined system, but that's not necessarily going to be the case. I mean, we already know there's the trivial solution. Right, so there's at least one solution to this guy. So, so here we go, let's, let's try this. C2 is 0, OK, that was easy. If C2 is 0, what else can we say? Well, since C1 plus C2 is 0, C1 must be 0. So these together give you that C1 is 0. That's not bad. And then we can plug that into the last guy and get that C3 is 0. So this forces the only solution to be them all zero, which is the trivial one, which means there's no trivial solution to this. Hence the answer is yes. They are linearly independent. I suppose an alternative way you could do that is you could plot these in your mind in four dimensional space and ask, are they all aligned within maybe a same plane? Or are the two span a plane and one points out of that plane? Right. But it's a little bit hard to visualize things in R4 sometimes, so it's nice we have this algebraic way to do it. Okay, so we can answer that question, but it's like we can't only answer that question. We have new questions we can answer too. Like instead of asking, are those linearly independent, I could instead ask, uh, how about we, instead of working in R4, we look at some collection of vectors in, say, the space of polynomials, maybe, maybe like these polynomials up to degree 3, 
So let's look at three polynomials. So what if I do something like the polynomial um, 2 plus x minus 3x cubed, the polynomial x plus x squared, and the polynomial 3 plus x cubed. And I want to know if those are linearly independent in P3. Yeah? Why? Yeah, it's like, well, secretly, they're the same. It's like, what, what do you mean they're the same? It's like, my coefficients here were 2, 1, a 0 coefficient for x squared, and a negative 3 coefficient. Yeah? It seems to correspond to this first vector. Here I have a 0 constant coefficient, a 0 x cubed coefficient, and a 1, 1. Same as a second vector, and so on. OK. So you're like, somehow this question is secretly the same as this question. To, to see that, it's like, how, how would we solve this? Well, we would do the exact same setup where we would just ask, is there some solution to some constant C1 times the first polynomial plus some constant C2 times the next polynomial plus some constant C3 times the third polynomial. You want to know, like, is there some solution to this? But then in order for there to be a solution to this, if we group these terms by their um, powers of x, we'd see this is really the same as saying, is there some solution to looking at constants, 2 times c1, plus no, there's no constant here, there's no uh, three constants here, plus 3 times c3, there's my constant term, plus the coefficient of my x's, here there's a c1 coefficient to my x, here there's a c2 coefficient to my x, here there is no x term, so c1 plus c2 times x. And now we want to go to x squared. Uh, no x squared. Here's a c2 x squared. And no x squared here. c2 x squared plus, and for my last one, x cubed, which is minus 3 c1. And down here, plus c3 x cubed is equal to 0. And that's only going to be equal to 0 when this first guy is zero, when the second guy is zero, when the third guy is zero, and when the fourth guy is zero, which is the exact same system of equations we had right here. Right, so like, like secretly, this is the same problem. Okay, okay can, can we come up with another problem that's secretly the same? Maybe instead of using vectors or polynomials, is there some other kind of way we could some other space we could work in that's equally the same? <coughs> what was that? Matrices. matrices, yeah. Let's, let's look in, in, in say, uh, the set of two by two matrices with, you know, matrices that have like real values. So, so what would be the four matrices we might consider? Yeah, like, well, we got to put those four values into this two by two matrix, and so maybe we'll just go like row by row. So, like, the vector 2, 1, 0, negative 3 becomes 2, 1 on top, 0, and minus 3 on bottom. The next one becomes just 0, 1, 1, 0. And the next one just becomes 3, 0, 0, 1. And we can ask if those <coughs> are linearly independent in this space of two by two matrices. And you're like, well, really, it's the exact same question as before, because to answer this, you would ask, is there some coefficients, are there some coefficients, C1, C2, C3, such that C2 times the first matrix plus C2 times the second matrix plus C3 times the third matrix gives you the zero matrix. You're like, well, that will be true when 2 times C1 plus 0 copies of C2 plus 3 times C3 is 0. That's, that's our first equation right here. Yeah? 
Uh, and same for each one, you cover your same system of equations. Okay, so we're seeing a lot of times we're working in these other vector spaces, but it's like secretly we're just doing this familiar problem of looking at vectors in R4, right? So we want some way to capture this idea of how can we reduce a problem in some other vector space into a problem that's just in familiar, you know, R to the N, whatever the dimension might be. And so how are we gonna do that? Well, we want some way to turn vectors that look like this, polynomials or matrices or whatever, back into our familiar looking vectors that we dealt with in introduction linear algebra. And it's like, well, the, co the, the key was, it's like the coefficients of these guys, or like these terms became it. So somehow like coefficients become significant. So, so here's gonna be our definition. <coughs> definition. If you have some finite basis, so if B, which contains some collection of vectors V1 through Vn, is a nice finite basis for a vector space V, <coughs> let's just remind ourselves what that means, then for any vector, um, brr, let's just say for any vector V inside your vector space, you can write V as a linear combination of these basis vectors. Okay, I haven't said anything new yet, I'll just remind you what, what it means to be a basis, right? So I can write V as a linear combination. Actually, we proved before that this is a unique. There's a unique way to write V as a linear combination of V1 through Vn, right? As long as your V1 through Vn uh, span all of B, you can write B, V, and as long as your V1 through Vn are linearly independent, then, then you can write this uniquely. So if it's a basis, there's a unique way to represent V. So we're gonna call, we're gonna call, here's our definition, our C1, our C2, up through our Cn, our coefficients. Just like we did for polynomials, just we call it coefficients with a coefficient vector which I'll denote by take my vector v and we're gonna read off the coefficients with respect to the basis b and that coefficient vector will just be the vector containing c1, c2 up through cn. Now, if V is a vector space over the reals, these will all be real valued coefficients. If a scalar is coming from the reals, this will then live in Rn. More generally, if V is over some other, other field, whatever field F, could be the real numbers, could be the complex numbers, whatever field you're working with, then this guy will live inside of Fn. Typically, we'll work with just scalars from the real numbers, right? So this will be something in Rn, but, if we're working with scalars that are complex, these would be complex numbers, so it would actually be in C n, right? Okay, so, so let's go back here and see how this plays out. Here I have these polynomials. What is my basis that I'm getting the coefficients from? What is my basis B? What is my basis for these polynomials? Yeah, just my powers of x, just one x, x squared, x cubed. Because then, if I write this with respect to that basis, I just recover I already have it lined up, right? It tells me it's two copies, 
of the first element in my basis, the first vector in my basis. So two copies of one, so I put a two there. One copy of x, zero copies of x squared, and negative three copies of x cubed, yeah? And, and you can continue to do this for all of them. You, you have x and x squared written with respect to the standard basis becomes zero copies of your constant, one copy of x, one copy of x squared, zero copies of x cubed. Or you could write this last one and you get three copies of your constant, zero copies <coughs> of x, zero copies of x squared, and one copy of x cubed. And it's like these vectors are the same as these vectors. Right? It's the original problem that we had looked at. And so looking for a linear combination of these guys, we can say, well, there's going to be a linear combination of these guys exactly when there's a linear combination of them with respect to your basis. But zero with respect to my basis is what? <coughs> well, zero is just zero copies of one, zero x's, zero x squared, zero x cubes. So this is just the zero vector. And so now this actually is identically the problem we had before. Right? Exact same problem we had before. How about over here? What, what basis should, should I be using? to convert this into the same thing I had before. What is a basis for the set of two by two matrices that make it so this guy becomes the vector two, one, zero, negative three? What was it? Yeah, it's just one with zeros everywhere else, one in the top left corner. Then we want the second one to the guy in the top right. So we'll put one in the top right corner. Then we'll put one in the bottom left corner. And then we'll put one in the bottom right corner. I suppose this is a little bit confusing in that this is set notation. Usually set does not denote an order, but here the order actually is important to remember the order of the coefficients. So, so here, this, I'm saying this is the first vector of my basis, this is the second vector of my basis, this is the third vector, and this is the fourth vector. So when I look at something like this matrix, and I want to convert it to this basis, you're like, well, in order to get this matrix, I just need two copies of this first matrix, then one copy of the second matrix, zero copies of the third one, and negative three copies of the fourth one. Yeah. And you can do that all the way across, where you can convert each of these matrices into this basis. And so this one just becomes 0, 1, 1, 0. This one just becomes 3, 0, 0, 1. And we want to, we was asking, is there some linear combination of these guys that gives you, well, him converted to your basis is just zeros all the way down which is exactly the original question we had asked. Happy? Okay, so hopefully this is making explicit the intuition that these three problems are somehow the same problem. Now, here we have picked this basis, one x, x squared, x cubed. We could have picked some other basis, Right? And, and so maybe, maybe just for the sake of completeness, we should do that. Let's, let's just give an example of imagining some other basis, say, for, for P3, and we'll calculate what one of these vectors ends up looking like. So let's imagine a different basis. So maybe B is kind of like a standard basis, but we could imagine some other basis, which I'll call, I don't know, maybe B prime. So what's another basis you can give me for P3? the set of cubic polynomials. Multiply two. Okay, so one basis is two, two x, two x squared, two x cubed. 
How will that change these vectors? Yeah, they're also gonna be scaled down by two, right? Now, two already is the first element, so that two would just become one, right? And x is a half of the second vector in your basis, so you would have a half there. These all get scaled down by a factor of two. Now, maybe we could do a slightly more interesting one. Give, give me another basis that, that we can, uh, that's another basis for P3. One, x plus one, x squared plus x plus one. Yeah, we've seen something like this before, and we verify that sure enough it is a basis. And now it's like, okay, if we wanna convert something like, well, let's take this first guy. I want to convert two plus x minus three x cubed into this new basis. I want to find what is the coefficient vector with respect to this new basis. And the problem is I can't just read it off anymore. Right, like before I can figure out what it is, I'm going to have to solve like how can, how can I write this as some linear combination of these basis vectors. Some C1 copies of one plus C2 copies of X plus one plus C3, copy, uh, C3 copies of X. Oh, I don't like this notation. I'm gonna call this C0, call this C1, I'm gonna call this C2. C2 copies of X squared plus X plus one plus C3 copies of X cubed plus X squared plus X plus one. Okay, and you can solve this. I, I don't know if I want to. Sometimes we have to do things we don't want to. Okay, let's do it. Um, let's group all the coefficients of the constant terms so that we get a C1 plus a C2 plus a C3 plus a C4. Plus, let's group all the coefficients of the x's so we get a C1, a C2, and a C3. Oh, that should be a C0, huh? C0 plus C1 plus C2 plus C3. Then all the coefficients of the x's become C1 plus C2 plus C3 in front of just uh, X plus, uh, it's a coefficient of X plus C2 plus C3 is your coefficient for X squared because here there's a C2 X squared and a C3 X squared plus C3 is your coefficient of X cubed. Okay, so, so what does this come out to be? What are your coefficients? Well, your last coefficient is just the coefficient of X cubed which is negative three, yeah. Then I know negative three plus C2 is, is zero. There's, there's, no co there's no coefficient to my X squared. My X squared coefficient is zero. So C2 must be three. And then it's like, okay. And then these guys add up to one, but they only canceled at zero. So he's just C1 is one. And then it's like, and all of them together has to give me two but I know that these three together gives me one, so my C1, my C0 must be a one as well. Okay, there we go. So we could convert it to some other basis, it's just a little bit less natural. Okay, are we happy so far with all of this? We can convert these all to this other basis. We have three of these vectors, we can ask if those three vectors are linearly independent, and those three vectors are linearly independent, exactly when these three are linearly independent, right? So, so you could do it with respect to some other basis. It's just sometimes it's a little bit less natural. So, that's the first observation I wanna draw from this. Um, let's ask one more. Let's come back to these three vectors. What if instead of asking if they're just linearly independent, I want to know, are these three vectors a basis for R4? Hey, Homan, are these three vectors a basis for R4? Can you see me? Yeah. Oh, cool. Are these three vectors a basis for R4? No. Why not? They don't span the space. Great. In order to be a basis, you have to be linearly independent and span the space. How do you know they don't span the space? 
Yeah, it's like, well, the answer is there's some vector in R4 that you can't build out of these. And it's like, what is that vector? I don't know because secretly I know they're not going to span the space because there's only three of them, right? But it's like, we never, we never said that, right? Like, like, what is this thing you're relying upon? Your intuition is like, to span R4, you need four vectors, right? So, so you're actually using a deep fact right now. We, we could prove they don't, but like, we already know they're not going to. And, and somehow it's like, it's kind of the same here. Like, will these three vectors be a basis for P3? It's like, well, here's a basis, and that one took four vectors, so I don't think I'm gonna base this with only three of them, right? Or, or same thing here, it's like, or are these three matrices a basis for M2? It's like, well, a basis, this basis needed four vectors, so probably any other basis is also gonna need four. You're not gonna be able to get by with just three. So, so let's try and capture that, let's prove that. Let's prove that. In linear algebra, you prove this for, like, in your first course, you prove this for R4. You prove, like, any basis for R4 needs four vectors. Now I want to prove that in general. Now, if one of your bases has four vectors in, in, you know, P3 or M2 or whatever, you won't get by with another basis having only three. But all of your bases have the same number of vectors. So here's, here's what we want to prove. Here's our theorem. Uh, let's say if B, which is, you know, some basis V1 through Vn, notice the finitely many guys in this one. We'll come back in a second and ask what if they're infinitely many, but finitely many for now. If this is, a, let me just stress, this is a finite basis for some vector space V. then any basis for V will have N vectors as well. Like intuitively, this seems right, but let's Let's try to prove it. Well, to prove this, you kind of think there's like two things to prove. One is that if you have this basis with n vectors and your friend comes along saying, here's a basis, but it has more than n vectors, it's like, well, how are you gonna to prove to your friend that's not actually a basis? You're like, yeah, if there's more than n vectors, your argument will be that's not linearly independent. Those are linearly dependent. And if your friend comes along with less than n vectors, your argument will be, well, that's not gonna span your entire basis, right? So, so really there's like two things we're gonna try and prove, um, or you could try and prove this by first saying if there's more than n, it'll be linearly dependent. If there's less than n, it won't span the whole thing. Let, let me first prove that first part, and I'm gonna separate this out from, from this main proof here. So I'm gonna call this a little lemma. A lemma is just what we call a proposition that is in service of some bigger theorem. It's like a step along the way. So here's my little lemma. I'm same setup. So, so if V has some basis with N vectors, V1, V2, up through Vn, then if your friend brings you more than n vectors, you know they have to be linearly independent. Then any set with more than v vector, n, uh, n vectors, so w1 up to some wm, where our m is bigger than n, So any, any set here that lives inside of V is linearly dependent. Too many vectors in it. So let's try and prove this. 
It's like, how in the world could you prove something like this? Well, I mean, the nice thing about linear algebra is like, all you have to work with is your definitions. I have some set of vectors. I want to prove the linear dependent. So it's like, OK, I want to prove some linear combination of them is going to have some, some non-zero solution to your Cs, right? But it's like, what else do I know? I also know that I have this basis, V1 through Vn. So I know that any other vector inside of V can be written as a linear combination of those guys. So like, those are kind of the only tools we have. OK, so here we go. Let's, let's begin by testing. I mean, let's look at, is there a solution to C1 times W1? I don't know if I want to call this C1. It might get confusing here in a second. So let me instead just call this uh, A1 times C W1 plus A2 times W2 up through AM times WM. We're looking to see, is there some solution to this guy? That's where we want to answer. It's like, I don't know what the hell W1 to WM are, so how can I possibly do this? Well, somehow I should take advantage of the fact I have a basis. Also, I should remember that this isn't something done in isolation, but we just talked about something. And so whenever you just talk about something, usually you use it, right? So we'll probably use this idea now. So, so what should we do? Ah, let's look at the coefficient vectors. We want to see, are there any solutions to this? Let's convert all of these in terms of our basis. Let's express these as coefficient vectors. Okay, how does that help? Well, let's think. Where does this coefficient vector live? Where does w, let's just say the ith one, convert it to a coefficient vector? Where does that live? Well, I didn't tell you what, what field v was over. So, so let's just say that v is over typically the real numbers, but it could be over some field f. So, so where is this going to live? Fn. Fn, because there are n vectors in the spaces b. So when we convert it to b, this is going to live inside of Fn. Right? So, so what is this really saying? This is saying this is, well, well, this means we can write W1 somehow. We, we could write W1, convert into this basis guy as, as some vector that has whatever the coefficients are. You know, you, you can write W1 as some linear combination of these guys and you read off the coefficients. And so if your W1, for instance, or your WI is, I don't know, let's call the coefficient CI1 times V1 up through CI, n times vn, then the vector for this will just be ci1, ci2, up through cin. I'm going to read off the coefficients. So here, the system of equations becomes instead a1 times some vector, which is c11, c12, down through c1n, plus a2 times whatever the coefficients are when you convert this into your basis v. So that's like c21, c22, down through c2n, all the way up until whatever your wm is when you convert it. So let's call that cm1, cm2, cmn is equal to zero. Ah, that's zero. Converting to our basis will just be zero vectors, the zero vector. Are you happy? Does this make sense? Where well, these are just coefficients in whatever your field are, real numbers or complex numbers or whatever field you're working over. But of course, this isn't one equation. This is secretly a system of n equations. So here we have n equations. 
And how many unknowns are there? Well, we're trying to solve for A1, A2, through AM, right? Those are the values you're trying to calculate. So there are M unknowns, N variables. And recall, we're dealing with the case where M is bigger than N. And M is bigger than N. So will there be a solution to this? Well, as long as we don't have any, uh, 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 like we didn't do any like, uh, ex well, no, I mean, there's really no problem. I mean, you have few equations that are known. It's underdetermined, right? Like how many solutions do you have? Infinitely many. There'll be infinitely many solutions. We already know there's one solution. There's, there's, there's the solution where all of these are zero. It's kind of a dumb solution. But since you have more unknowns than equations, it's underdetermined until you know there's infinitely many solutions. Hence, there must be one that's non-trivial. Hence, there exists a non-trivial solution. But if there exists a non-trivial solution, then that shows that these are linearly dependent. So, so this means there exists a non-trivial solution, thus linearly dependent. Are we happy? Okay. Too few equations, right? I mean, just like think back to algebra. I mean, this is this is really a, a, an introduction to the algebra fact, but it's when you have, uh, uh, you know, if you have like three unknowns and two equations, three unknowns, x one plus three x three is zero, and you know. Uh, x1 plus x2 plus x3 is zero. Two equations, three unknowns. There are infinitely many solutions. You can solve for like your x1 and your x2 in terms of x3 or something. But x3 you let vary, and then you can have any other solutions you want for x1 and x2, like you get infinitely many solutions as x3 varies. Okay. Um, this is like if you, like you're only guaranteed a, the only time we can possibly hope for a unique solution is when you um, either have the same number of equations as unknowns, or you have extra equations, but some of them are redundant, right? But when you have too few equations, it, it's underdetermined. You, you have too much like, range of motion for these guys. So, so this is a, like, uh, you should remind yourself of this fact from like, linear algebra. I think like high school algebra hints at it, but surely you proved this in introduction linear algebra. Okay. So, so let's take this fact now and try and prove our theorem. If, if someone comes with more than n vectors, we can say the linear dependent. So, so now let's try and prove this theorem. And you might think like we've done half the work, but actually I want to argue we've actually done all the work. Right, if we're, if we're thoughtful about it, we've actually proved the theorem already. Let's just unpack this lemma and convince ourselves that we really have. So, um, we have some basis B. Suppose there's some other basis. Uh, what should we call it? I guess, I don't really want to call it B prime. Uh, if I call it A, is that confusing? Hopefully not. A, which comprises the vectors U1, u2 up through ul. This is another basis for your vector space v over whatever your ground field f is. Then what I want to show is l 
must be the same thing as n. So there are like two ways this could fail, two cases we should think about. The first case is what happens if L is bigger than n, but we already know the answer to that, and what is it? Yeah, by our lemma, since we have a basis B, and it has n vectors, and we're assuming L is fewer, oh, oh we're assuming L is bigger, we're assuming L is bigger, well, we know those must be linearly dependent. So if L is bigger than N, then you get that your U1 through UL are linearly dependent by the lemma, which would give you a contradiction. Now, you might still think, yeah, but we haven't really thought about the case, what if L is less than N? Our contrary, we have. If L is less than N, we're going to use the lemma again, but now we're going to say A is a basis for V. Right? We're supposing A is a basis for V. So we have a basis with L elements. What does the lemma tell you about B? Well, B, N is bigger than your L, so by your lemma, your V1 through your Vn would have to be linearly dependent by the lemma, which would also contradict the fact that we said it is a basis. Yeah. So we can use the lemma on both of these. We just switch which one we think about as being this basis here. We, for, for the first half, we said, let B be a basis. For the second half, we replace this with A being the basis. And then we said if A is this basis, then this collection B would no longer be a basis. Hence, you must have that L is equal to N. Be on the lookout for symmetry like this, because sometimes you double your work. Or really, it's like, it seems like we only proved half the theorem, but actually that was the entire theorem. Right? If we just apply the lemma in the correct way, that actually did all the work for us. Of course, it then follows from this that if someone comes with a collection with less than n vectors that are linearly independent, it's not a basis. It can't be a basis. And so you know any collection of less than n vectors that are linearly independent must not span B because it's not a basis. Right? So we get that fact that we want it to, to have anyway, but we didn't have to use it in the proof. It just comes out of it. If you have too few vectors, they're not going to span it. If you have too many, they're going to be linearly impotent. Okay, so all bases have the same number of elements. So we should give that number a name, or what should we call it? Dimension. So now we can make sense of this notion of dimension. So we're going to add as a definition, if, so, so, so let's say uh, V has a basis V1 through Vn. So if V has some basis like this, then we'll say the dimension of V is N. And someone might have picked a different basis. Whatever basis you pick, it has to have N elements. Here, we're going to call these finite dimensional vector space. If there is no finite, if there is, if there's no finite basis, then we'll say the dimension of V is infinite. And that will be called an infinite dimensional vector space. <laughs> 
infinite dimensional. Yeah? What's an example of infinite dimensional vector space? The set of all polynomials. Well, in that case, um, the, it's infinite, it's countably infinite, right? Because it's like the, the um, vectors are one, x to the one, x to the two, x to the three, up to x to the n for all values n, countably infinite. Is it possible there's uncountably many? Can you think of a vector space like that? Okay, great. So maybe you should toy around with this and commit to yourself that the collection of all real value functions, it, it has an infinite dimensional vector space and that is, that is, uh, that, that, that is uncountably. That, that does rely on a fact that, that I haven't written explicitly. I think I alluded to it last time. But, but here we're kind of assuming there is a basis. And, and one could prove that. So let me just remind you, there is a theorem that says any vector space, any vector space V has a basis. But the proof of this relies on something called Zorn's lemma. So maybe if I find time in another class, um, I'll give you the proof and like, tell you what Zorn's lemma is, and we'll go through the proof. We don't have time for it today. I can tell you about this in office hours also. But um, this uses something called Zorn's lemma, which is equivalent to something called the axiom of choice, which is independent from the other axioms of set theory, and Jamelo Frankel's set theory, ZF set theory. And so you could build up set theory and reject the axiom of choice and not hold this in order to make this claim. For instance, the uh, weird ones like the vector space of all real value functions or continuous functions or things like this, you need to appeal to Zorn's lemma. I think the last thing I'll, I'll mention is um, we said that this uh, dimension is finite. What kind of numbers can it take? Well, can it be like the negative number? Probably doesn't make sense. Can it be like one, two, three, four, five? Yeah, just r to the one, two, three, four, five, so you get an integer. Can it be zero? What would a zero dimensional vector space look like? What is it? Yeah, so, so in your homework you showed that the empty, the empty set is not, is not a vector space. Why not? One of our criteria to be a vector space is it must contain a zero vector, right? You need zero inside of it. So then the next candidate might be, well, how about this guy? And you're like, well, well why isn't that just one dimensional, right? Why isn't it just like all scalars of zero which all happen to be zero? Answer, well, if you just take zero by itself, it's, it's already linearly dependent. Because any, you know, this, this solution gives you, gives you zero for non-trivial solutions. And so we call this a zero dimensional vector space. This is the one and only zero dimensional vector space. Or everything is equivalent to this, just the zero vector in whatever space you're looking in is the zero dimensional vector space. Okay, we'll stop there for today.